All right. Happy Friday, everyone. And it is that time again where we are going live with another episode of Learning Tech Talks, where we're exploring the landscape of learning tech, cutting through the fluff, and helping you do digital right. So today I have Annalise Wall and Christopher Christensen, and we're tackling a couple of the big popular buzzwords in the learning space, simulations and gamification. So more to come on that. Uh, if you're joining us live, go ahead, give us a thumbs up, share the post, tag in somebody who would enjoy the conversation while we're getting started. Uh, and while you're at it, comment in, let us know where you are joining us from. We've got a big global audience, so share with the group where you are and, and interact with each other as as throughout the, throughout the show. So I'm from Wisconsin, as always, uh, and it is a scorcher today. It is hot. It is 95 or or 36, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, so it's going to be a warm one here. Uh, how about everybody else? Uh, Christopher, we'll start with you since you're right next to me right now. All right. Hello, Christopher, and thanks for having me and for us. Um, I'm in London, actually. Uh, I'm originally from Norway, but I moved to uh, London uh, three years ago. And here the, it is a bit rainy today, so it sounds like I'm, uh, I would definitely prefer your weather. Okay. Well, you might not because it is actually ridiculously hot. So I do have to ask before I go on here, you because your accent did, I'm like, you're in London. You don't have a London accent. What actually brought you to London then from Norway? So it is actually a Tensi. I joined the Tensi like six and a half years ago. Okay. And uh, three years ago, I basically uh, set up the UK office and have uh, been building a team here. Okay. Got it. Got it. Well, that's a good reason. All right. How about you, Annalise? Where are you today in the world? So hi, everybody. And, and thank you. Yeah. Um, calling in from Oslo in uh, northern Norway. So Scandinavia is, is where I am with the same weather as you have, Christopher, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is brilliant, but quite unusual to be up in the cold north. So uh, yeah, I'm going to enjoy the, the sunny weekend after yeah. after this show. Yeah. <laughs> after the show, which yeah. actually, the funny part is everybody watching, we talked about this before we went live. The, the houses there she shared with me, it's much hotter indoors than it yeah. actually is outdoors. Yeah. So everybody keep an eye on Annalise because if she starts to, you know, just pass out, um, mm -hmm. someone give her a call and make sure that <laughs> make sure she's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining live. Uh, before we get into the actual learning tech piece, all right, our, our completely unrelated question, and I encourage everybody to participate in this one. But I'm very curious to hear, Krista and, and Annalise, where you landed on this. If you could instantly have a talent, you became a master of something, you didn't need the 10,000 hours of practice, you just overnight had it, what would it be? And I'm going to reverse the order here. So Annalise, I'm actually going to start with you on this one. So actually, I think my superpower would be, at first I was thinking rock climbing, like, okay. yeah. yeah, but then free climbing. I mean, watching... Oh, wow the guys going like the 90 degree steep hills or, or walls okay. on like a free solo four hours. Yeah, no, no ropes, no harnesses. No ropes, no nothing. I mean, that must be closest to, to flying and being in heaven uh, Wow. To, wow. to start with. So, so free climbing. Okay. I would never dare do it like well, a I have to up. ask then, if that's the talent you picked, right? If that's the talent you picked, you know what? I want to walk up climb a 90 degree vertical rock with no support. Are you an adventurer? Do you do like extreme anything? Are you into that kind of stuff in general? Yeah, yeah. so I'm a very outdoorsy person, do lots of hikes in, in the mountains in, in, in Norway, which are beautiful. But as soon as like, if you are about, I don't know, 20% like the steepest hills, I chicken out. Okay. So that's where I really want to have this superpower to be able to proceed, yeah. Okay, all right. So you're an outdoorsy person, but we won't find you jumping out of airplanes or, you know, skydiving, anything like that. No, right. not without the superpower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about you, Krister? What's yours? Well, my, if I could have an area where I instantly became super talented, it would be Donkey Kong uh, Tropical Freeze, which is a, a game on the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> now, why would I want to be a champion on that? Well, I have a seven-year-old daughter, and she is playing like crazy on it. 
and we are looking at these YouTube videos and she's looking at these videos and saying like, that would be these like Japanese superstars who are playing through these levels and they are doing it so easily. And she is always looking at me like, Daddy, why can't we play it like that? And I, I always feel like I'm inadequate. I wish I could be better so I could help her through these uh, platforms. So uh, if I could choose right now a super talent, that would be mine. That is probably one of the best answers. I, I did not see that one coming. I have to say, I did not see that one coming. So you've been you've been shamed by your kids for your video <laughs> game abilities. So to be yes. super dad, you want you yes. want to be able to crush it and just uh, defeat the competition at, at that. All right, all right, that's that's fantastic. All right, so mine, I would say mine would be, and I don't know if I would have to limit it to just one, but right, like some sort of wicked martial arts. Like to be mm -hmm. to be Jason Bourne and just mm -hmm. out of nowhere wake up one day and somebody you know puts their hand on your shoulder and you zing them across the room and you you don't even know what happened you're just like wow this is epic that yeah. would be pretty fantastic I don't know if my kids are old enough to really appreciate how awesome it would be if Dad was just like <laughs> Superman in that sense but uh, that that would be the one that I would pick. All right. Mm. That was fun. That was fun. Definitely unexpected. So, so Annalise, you're an adventurer. You'd be an adventurer and extremist. And Krista, you would just be killing it at, at video games <laughs> like it. All right. Well, so let's transition into a tensi and we we've kind of leading up to this, we've talked about, you know, simulations, gamification, all this stuff. And we'll dig into what that stuff means because it does mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but just getting started with it, what what when you when somebody says what is a tensi, what is your answer to that? How do you explain that to people? And I'll let you both have the chance. Mm. So I mean, a tensi. I mean, we're pretty bold, so we're going to be the global leader of, of gamification and simulation-based training. Is our answer to that? And basically, what we do is that through every part of corporate learning and training, we're going to provide you with fun, engaging, and motivating training that sticks okay. and that provides impact with, with the organization. Okay. So, uh, Krista, I, I yeah. <laughs> gloves, gloves are thrown. Yeah, gloves are thrown. From <laughs> Norway, UK, and then conquer the world. All right. Um, and, I mean, we came from um, the gaming business. Uh, okay. starting at Tensi, and we had two insights from the gaming business. So the founders came from, from the gaming and from management consulting, and then getting tools that could provide impact uh, while motivating the, the workforce was kind of the, the essence. Mm. From the gaming business, we had two core insights, and um, one of them was that gaming industry or gaming studios, at least in, in the Nordics, frequently get asked if they could do this one of project for uh, a company or any kind of learning bits and piece of one of project. Okay. So that frequently came to the, we were doing like AAA uh, massive multiplayer online games like World of Warcraft and the like. Okay. And mm -hmm. even though people came and asked, so can you do a learning game for us? Or can you do this onboarding game? Or can you do a sales training for us? And then, no, we're doing entertainment games. Okay. So we're not going to hop on and do all of these one-off projects. But yeah. then that one insight combined with the fact that so many businesses like fighter pilots, defense, uh, surgeons have been using 3D simulations for workforce or task training for so many years because it's the next big best thing to, to reality. That led us to think, okay, so there's something here. No one is doing this on like a tool basis and a, a enterprise basis at scale. And although we were based in, in Norway, we thought, well, there's a potential here. And that was six okay. years ago. And six now we're here. Ago. Yeah. Awesome. Anything you'd add to it, Krister? Yeah, no, I think uh, from, from, I think you said it well, Annalisa, but I would say like, what we fundamentally believe in is that in order to achieve mastery and excellence, you need to gain that through experience. And I think what we basically have found through these uh, gamified simulations are that we are able to create bespoke simulations that lets you 
be in that situation and learn from that situation even before you're actually there. So we make it realistic. We make it gamified so it's fun to play. We give you points and so on and keep you motivated. But that the essence of what we do is really about we are building bespoke video games based on the companies we work for, their best practice. So that's, I think, trying to summarize it in a slightly different way than, than Annalisa just described. Yeah. Well, and I think yeah. it's interesting, you know, you shared that you actually came from the gaming industry, which, um, you know, is is unique because to me, I'm curious, that's not necessarily a transition that a lot of people would necessarily connect the dots and say, right? I mean, we were talking about, we we're talking about video games in the icebreaker, I, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of people at Blizzard or Nintendo thinking, you know what, we should take what we're doing and we should turn it into a learning game. But mm -hmm. you obviously did. So was was there, a, I mean, it sounds like people were asking about this in general, right? And at the time, at first you were saying, no, that's not what we do. We're not, we're not an education. Was there something that pushed you to a tipping point where you said, hey, we're getting asked this so much. Maybe there's something to it. So absolutely the demand that we experienced at the gaming studio was one trigger for it, but also Atensi has two founders. So the one came from the gaming industry and the other came from the traditional right. learning industry. So he had developed traditional uh, e-learning, video learning, like the what we call passive learning because you click and consume right. uh, without very much interaction. And he had quit his, his e-learning startup to start Atensi because he had a belief that there has to be, and this was in the retail uh, business. So he was like, you have to be able to make a 3D store where you can walk in, where there will be um, uh, virtual customers that you could help out, that you can spot from stealing, that you could uh, do all of this sales training in stores. So that was actually the starting point. So he started with a few clothing stores with like virtual training in a 3D space that like opened the eyes of so many people. And then he joined forces with the other founder who came from the gaming industry, which knew so much about how to build the technology, how to build a tool set. Because if there's one thing that uh, differentiates the Ubisofts, the EAs, the best gaming studios out there, it's the fact that they have the best tool sets and the platform and the technology. Okay. So they really know, I mean, EA can push out FIFA game every other year because right. they have the, the tool sets to make the best animations and, and soccer games. And the same knowledge uh, was something that we carried with us. So we saw there's a potential here at that time, especially in retail, to do these virtual stores and, and train the workforce and then combined with how to make these uh, games really, really cost effective okay. and really, really realistic. Okay. So that was kind of the, the combination that triggered the whole whole starting of it. Okay. Well, and that that helps me understand kind of how that came together. Because I can see, right, there's probably plenty of people in the learning space who have been saying, we, we need to create kind of this environment or things like that. And we, we haven't necessarily had the tool set. So on the gaming side, and I will say over the years, that has in some regards been prohibitive to actually going into it because it's ex it, it can be very expensive if you're going to somebody who doesn't necessarily do this at scale because they don't have the tools and creating a custom environment, rendering all the custom care. I mean, it can get very expensive. I have to imagine then there's also an element that came from the game side because game design, there's a fair amount of psychology behind you know, what are the triggers? What actually draws people in? There's plenty mm -hmm. of really bad video games out there that aren't actually driving engagement and that actually draw people in. They're like, yeah, I could play this for about five minutes and then I I'm not necessarily entertained by that. And I'm sure mm -hmm. that you can apply some of those same principles to learning them. Absolutely. So we apply the exact same. I mean, today, Fortnite is probably the, the best example of a game which I gave top score on every single element of the game. So the social part, the, the scoring balance part, the animations and how you can dance, how you can, I mean, you yeah. can express yourself. And then also to connect with the other players, which is something which is at the core of what we do is that you, we want to simulate 
uh, human behavior. So that the customer that you meet in, in the store or that you talk to, I think we have a screenshot that we can share after, is, is so realistic that you're kind of immersed into the whole dialogue and then your emotions triggers. Yeah. And then the learning will stick so much better than if, if you read a manual or, or watched a, a video. And this is something that we instantly saw in retail. And Christer was brought on like at the start of the company with his, he had worked massively with uh, retail in, in Boston Consulting Group previously. And then bringing the, the, the psychology together with the like impact analysis to prove that this actually has effect on sales, on customer satisfaction and Christy can fill in so much more on that uh, as well as like uh, a powerful uh, <laughs> yeah, combination that uh, that started the whole journey. Okay. Yeah, I, I think at, at the end of the day, we wanted to see not just that we had a cool concept that people thought were cool, but that actually changed behaviors. And at the end of the day, that was how we wanted to measure success. So when I came on board as well, we started doing more of these like in-depth correlation analysis, actually looking at the play data, but together with the actual real life data and actually started learning from that. So that's been a journey for us now for, for the time I've been here for, for more than six years now, where we really tried to understand which are the mechanics that really seem to work and actually teaches behavior and which are actually some that we thought were good ideas, but actually don't have that much of an impact. So, so we really are learning and we've created a system and a platform that allows us to very quickly understand this is gold, this is not so much gold. Let's see how we can tweak and get it even better next time. And I think uh, to date we have made more than 350 simulations. So, I mean, our experience at this point is, is of course, quite advanced from, from when we all got started. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've got to say we've got we've got James sold here, so James, <laughs> James is all on board. I, I don't think a lot of people were expecting if they tuned in today they were going to be hearing us talk about Fortnite and EA and and all this other stuff. But I, you know, back in the day, I was I was a big World of Warcraft player. I played a ton of World of Warcraft, and there is a lot of things that you look about that right. The social components, how do you connect people? There were reasons that you would binge. You know, there are weekends I don't remember existed because. You didn't get up from your chair. Now, I'm curious, though, on that, because mm. when it comes to corporate learning and development, mm. that can probably spark some mixed reviews on that because, you know, right, are, are we, is that really what we want people doing is is binge gaming on, on learning stuff? I don't think that's what you're mm. getting at, but how do you balance that so that that's where you, know, you kind of find that sweet spot of, yes, we want to make it engaging enough. We want to drive people to actually want to, to do this stuff. Well, at the same time, they're, they're not, you know, kind of going too far with it. Yeah. And I think on that point, and it's an excellent point, and one that we definitely hear quite often from, from our, our customers as well. I think what we see is that, if you create something that is really relevant for people, that makes them feel better at their job, there will be that urge to really master that. But as soon as they typically feel like, I have mastered it now, I get it, I get it, I really get it, then actually their interest starts fading off. Okay. What we do see, though, is that that is very different from different kind of people. Some are learning, and within a couple of repetitions, maybe five repetitions, they feel, I got this. Others might need 20 or 30 repetitions to get to that same stage, but that's okay. Because I think like this kind of platform allows you to learn in a safe environment and it's your experience. It's not like you don't have to be like everyone else. So you get score for every time and some go quite gradually upwards and some make big jumps and that's that's totally okay. That's, that's your journey. Okay. And, and I do think like, yeah, sorry. No, I was going to say, so you're really kind of tapping into the personalization of it, right? Because everybody does have, you know, their own comfort level and things like that. Back to my original question, if I'm understanding correctly, what you're seeing from the data is that that kind of risk of almost addictive behavior for gaming mm. doesn't happen because you're designing the game to say, hey, we're trying to drive you to master this capability. So yes, you know mm. what, if you binge on this game for a bit, until you feel like you can master this behavior, that's actually okay. 
But yep. naturally, once you do that, it's kind of like when you get the cheat codes for video games and suddenly it's not yep. hard anymore. Suddenly it's not as exciting to play because you're like, well, I already know how to do this. So if mm -hmm. I'm, is that an accurate kind of a, a summary? Yes. Yeah, it is. And also if you relate it to the traditional video games, I don't know, one of my favorite games of all time is Crash Bandicoot. I don't know <laughs> if you play that, Christopher. <laughs> yes, I know it. Yeah. Because because the thing with Crash Bandicoot, if you if you relate, it's a platformer where a fox runs and like collects all these yeah bits and pieces, and he can run the 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 platform and get to the finish line and have collected a bunch of things and he succeeds and is finished, and then after he can run the course a second, a third, backwards to collect different other achievements, prizes, come to the top of the leaderboard. And it's the same kind of mechanic uh, that we implement in our games. So if your employer has set a level of compliance or like training goal for, for this specific training, okay. that's where you need to be at. And you're approved and you're good. But just as in games, you have these archetypes of, of players. So the achiever or the very competitive guy or girl will not give up until he's at top of the, or I say he because it's mostly men in that, in that <laughs> group, but it's, it's quite a few girls as well. That will be, unless he's at, on top of the leaderboard, he will continue. And when his colleague beats him, he will rejoin. And they can even do battles and they can, I mean, they can keep going and keep going and keep going. And to kind of control that also we do the games typically in playthrough periods or campaigns. Okay. So now it's like a one month campaign on, on IT security, for instance, mm. and you go. And then the next campaign can be store operations and you go. So right. also, yeah, we have a cool down period to to keep that controlled. <laughs> <laughs> so so because this is fascinating to me, right? Because, again, all the things you're talking about are things that, you know, I mean, I think, I, again, I'll use World of Warcraft as the background to this because they did the same thing, right? They built mm -hmm. in achievements for different things so that you as on a personalization level. Yeah, maybe you maybe you'd already taken Onyxia down 10 times, but had you done it without you know, without mm. anybody dying, things like that, where mm -hmm. you're like, well, now you're going to go back and you're going to try and reinforce and hone and perfect your behavior because you're trying to get the achievements. Some people cared about those and yeah. some people don't. And I think yeah. to Nancy's point, right, there's a lot of self-discovery that is happening in this, but, but it sounds like you're actually building the games to allow you to have the freedom to do that as a learner, to be able to do that. Yeah. And also to be mindful of the, the the time spent of the of the players, right? Because we we like Fortnite. Fortnite is a twenty minute uh, playthrough period because that's. I mean, Epic has figured out that twenty minute is the perfect attention span of a fourteen year old player because the dopamines and everything <laughs> go crazy in the minds. For for corporate training, we do five minutes. Okay. For us adults, no. <laughs> so, so, and we try to position the training chunks or the the scenarios to be between three and ten minutes. Okay. To also to fit into your everyday life and also to be, so that you're able to complete and to progress, even if you're on the subway or you are at the end of your lunch break. But then also mm -hmm. to to make it fit in so that you can actually progress and master. Uh, throughout the day, which is okay. really important. Yeah, that's that's actually one of the questions that I'm pretty sure I know. This is Corrine. For whatever reason, you can't get Corrine's name to show up, but it's fine because I know I know when she's asking questions. Is so you talked about this? How much time are people actually spending on this? Can you elaborate a little bit more when you design one of these games? When you design one of these, I, I call them serious games because I think that helps differentiate between okay, are we talking like a leaderboard or some badge, mm -hmm. or are we talking about serious game, which is which is really the rank we're talking about here? What what kind of time are people spending in that? And are you seeing people you know blow that out of the water? Or do you really kind of hit that sweet spot? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, we have quite a few different customers who put up 
a journey and it depends on how much content they put into that journey and the difficulty level of that content. Um, most of our customers would create content in their first training that typically would take people about one hour to really get through as one course. And then they would typically be adding courses later on. Uh, some of course play much more. I just, uh, I came back from Phoenix a few months ago, just before this whole lockdown period and so on. And we were working with a US uh, client there who basically wanted us to cap. Uh, so basically after two hours, you are thrown out of the game. You're not allowed to play anymore because Great they were fearing job. exactly what you were saying. <laughs> So we definitely have some examples. We don't actually normally in Europe. They, uh, you don't. There's not the same rules around labor and so on. So typically, there are some who plays hundreds of times. Um, but that's almost it's it becomes epic. Almost it becomes part of the storyline. But we can also cap it if if needed to. Okay. So there are parental controls for. for <laughs> We don't want our people spending too many hours playing this game. Yeah. I guess so. well, if you have to pay for those hours, then definitely you want to have a cap. True. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, though, that's a, in my opinion, that's a good problem to have. You know, if, if you're looking at, I mean, I think so often in learning and development, we're looking at how do we actually get people to engage? I, I would yeah. almost rather have the issue of, man, people are engaging so much. We actually need to cut them off because mm. they're, they're just learning too much. Let's, let's actually back them, back them out. So interesting that um, you, you do have the safeguards in there, which one completely unrelated thing, by the way, Lisa, um, there's a lot of people chiming in that they uh, love your love for Crash Bandicoot. So there are a lot of Crash Bandicoot fans <laughs> <laughs> watching. Again, I think probably a lot of people are like, why are they talking so much about video games? But hopefully uh, there's <laughs> the podcast. <laughs> right? Because I think what we're talking about is actually driving a big connection between this, right? Video games are not, yes, they can be used for entertainment, but they're a powerful tool and there's a reason why um, they, they do have those those capabilities. So let's dig into this piece um, because we talked a little bit about the simulation and, and Hugh has one of them up. Let's actually show, right? We can show that screenshot of what that is just so talk, talk us through a little bit about what this one is here uh, and, and what we're seeing. Absolutely. So I think um, this is uh, is uh, from one of our solutions that we made for the Boston Consulting Group. Okay. Um, so Boston Consulting Group, I mean, when you're hired there as a consultant, you are basically coming on board typically quite young. You might be in your late 20s very often, and you are put in, in front of these clients where you are to suddenly give them advice on how to run their business. So you are suddenly giving advice to people who have maybe 20 or 30 years of experience within their industry and you are straight out of school and you are to give them advice on, on how they are to do things. And that's part of the model. I mean, they, they hire uh, really bright people and so on. But very often, one of the key challenges, and you know, I, re uh, I, I sympathize to this. I was, as you know, uh, also in the Boston Consulting Group for more than six years. Uh, and sometimes you do meet clients that are sort of like challenging you and are saying like, well, what do you really know about this subject? You look rather young. And this is one of those examples. And basically you would then very often feel like you're on the on the back foot of sort of like, how should I respond to this? And what we try to then capture in this moment, one thing is her tone of voice and we can put on time pressure. So you sort of like have to answer within a certain number of seconds and so on. But we try to create that uh, moment of sort of like stress and look at the kind of answers that are typically given in that situation and also try to then create some reflections around what are the nuances that really make the best answer being the best answers. We can have on the uh, character, we can have their facial expressions. We can have, as you go through the, the journey, you might have to build trust with them. Uh, and unless you have enough trust with them, you can't actually get them to do the things you want to and so on. So we have quite a few game mechanics also in terms of like how you can see visually uh, their their body language and so on change as you move on, but it gives you that feeling of I'm in the situation I'm and and therefore it feels like an experience rather than a learning theory and and principle so to speak. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I think this is you know we talked about this. I've talked about this on a number of episodes that 
you know, in learning and development, a lot of times we've, we've focused a lot on content and, you know, delivering content to people. And I think there's tremendous opportunity in the space for us to focus more on experience and practice. Mm -hmm. And, and that's not to take away from the content or to say that that's mm -hmm. not valuable. There's absolutely a need to baseline and make sure people have that. But at the same point, you don't get better at something by, by reading about it or watching it. You, you get better by doing it. And I think this is, you know, almost kind of a, a sweet spot in the middle where you're saying, all right, we, before you go do it with a customer, before you go, actually, we put you in, in Boston Consulting Group in front of one of our toughest clients, let's at least give you a chance to do that, which, mm. so let's, so let's dive this back because that can almost sound, I think for some people who may be listening, overwhelming. If you've, mm. if you've ever tried to design this stuff in the past, like in the past, I remember mm. designing very early in my career, a mm. small learning video game. And mm. by the time we got into the branching and all the different components, and it's actually one of the things that was asked here, right? How are these, how are these simulations designed? What are the different conditions that you're actually putting in? Um, and, and what's that look like from a consumer side or from the learning side? If, if somebody partners with you and say, hey, we want to design a simulation, how does that is it custom? I guess the first question is, is this a custom build or is this a, hey, we have these prefab games that you can do? And then we can actually dive into what that looks like. So it's a yes to the last question. It's a prefab. It's a platform. Okay. So from the very first day, we wanted to do the same as the, the gaming studios to make the tools, the technology okay. platform, enabling not only us, but also the customers, partners to create so the best word these days is a no code platform okay. so that you can develop any content without having a program okay which is something which has been the like long term vision since day 1 and actually now the past 2 years this platform is ready it's out there it's used by a third of our customers to a half of our customers to create mm. uh deploy publish their own games and okay. it's a full library of avatars of office buildings of uh, store space branching dialogue tools translation tools the full shebang that you need to develop a video game is actually part of our platform it's based it's on top of one of the biggest commercial gaming engines out there called unity so we yep. have all the power from unity um, as the fundamental and then we have this large super easy to use platform on top, which is more powerful than any of the big e-learning editing tools because yeah. you have the full 3D elements. So it's where I'd mm. say to create a bespoke game hard-coded from scratch would typically take, oh, I'd say God. from six to 12 months. Then a simulation mm. game like this could be done in a few months or even weeks. Okay. I think the quickest we've done was like a one to two weeks because we have the templates. So we have the gaming or the game templates so that we can just populate with the content that, uh, that are specific. Yeah. Okay. So to clarify, because my point, my question, and I think this helps me understand, break this down. So I'll kind of synthesize this and then you tell me if I'm, I'm on target. The platform attency is actually, there are components of it that are pre-built, right? The avatars, the, the different elements so that you're not custom coding and mm -hmm. rendering new new environments all the time. But from a development standpoint, a customer can then take those environments, take those templates, if you will, and then tailor them to their specific yeah. situation. So it's not completely off the shelf in the sense that it's like, well, we created this one simulation and everybody has to go through it. It's like, no, we've created some templates we've created some things to make that happen and then have created the tools for you to then bring that in and say all right how do we apply or create a situation specific to what we're dealing with right now is that fair that is spot on and i do think it's it's uh what what you also mentioned initially christopher and in, in terms of um it can be a nightmare to create content because you know as you say like the branches and so on it can really become quite quite uh, an experience in itself yeah. Now, the thing is, we've done this now for like 350 solutions. We know how to go about this. So okay. we work alongside our clients, typically on the first uh, project that maybe they can, if they want to, they can have us support them the whole whole way through. But the first solution we typically create by having 
three about three different like uh, content workshops with them to really understand what they're trying to teach. And then we actually create the content for them and let them iterate it. And if there's one thing I've learned through these years is, is that you're never going to get it right on the first go. You yeah. need to create something and iterate on it and let people try it. And then you're going to get it better and better and better. And we basically help our clients then structure their thoughts on sort of like, what is the learning objective in this solution? What is the, the weight of sort of like, if you break that down, what, how, how important is this point uh, okay. to get the cross and how do we, how do we make that into a journey? So um, it's a collaborative uh, uh, approach. It's not just a tool, and then we give it to our clients and say, good luck, yeah, but it, it's really... <laughs> well, that, <laughs> I'm glad you added that clarification because that was going to be my follow-up question because yeah. just like just like an e-learning development platform, right? You hand that to somebody, you just throw it to a subject matter expert and say, hey, here, go create e-learning. Yeah. I've seen the stuff that comes out of that, and it's not pretty, right? You know, And, and kind of going back to that point of just because you design a game doesn't mean... It's going to do all the things we talked about in terms of, you know, get people engaged. There's plenty of horrible video games out there that were just like, who made this? Like, why is this even created? And so it's, it's, so it's helpful to understand that, yes, that tool set exists. It's there for you, but you're not just handing it off as kind of the experts in gaming and saying, hey, we build really great games. Here's our toolkit. Knock yourself out. Mm. Okay. So when, what are some, I'm just curious from a, you know, are there typical, just so people can kind of wrap their heads around where, where some of these use cases might be. Do you see mm. common situations kind of come up that maybe are mm. an entry point for companies or mm. are there themes that you see or, or some of the templates that you have where you go, you look, these are, these are behaviors or these are simulations that we know happen a lot that we we've kind of focused on or are a good jumping off point. Hmm. Maybe Annalisa wants to uh, answer the high level, and then I can go into sure, some. Yeah, let's let's take it up and then bring it in. Yeah. Sure. So, so on the high level, I, I mean, every sector, every business could benefit from this. Uh, but over the past six years, we've seen lots of interest. One is in retail, which we started on, which is so. And Chris, you can talk more about some very good examples both there and in in other sectors, but also in health. We've done quite uh, large projects in health in, in work processes. So some of the biggest hospitals in Norway, when they build a new hospital, introduce new work processes, new IT systems, okay. they would typically then can take the architectural model of the, the hospital, make it into a game so that the full, in one case, it was 5,000 nurses, doctors and, and healthcare workers moving into a new facility. They could then train on where are everything located, uh, how do the new work processes work, there's new IT systems. We can actually embed the IT systems into the 3D Environment. world. So that if, so in this one hospital, they were going for mobile-based on-call system. Okay. So if a patient called, then not the light in the, in the hallway as, as usual, but then they would get a call on, on the mobile. And then we could embed that whole experience into the digital hospital. So they could then actually train on which button or which code do I press on my mobile phone and how do I respond to this app on this uh, hospital phone to get to that uh, patient and, and help him out. Okay. So we can embed all the parts of not only the like, human interaction, but also IT systems and the whole okay. um, ecosystem of a new facility. Also in, in industry, which is quite mature in, in using 3D simulations, I'd say oil and gas, defense, yeah. um, anything mechanical. Um, doing HMS has been a big, big sector. Okay. I mean, some of the biggest aluminum producers are located in Norway, and they have now full HM or sorry in English it's HSC health, health safety environment <laughs> and in Norwegian uh, sorry so HSC uh, training within the, a virtual factory okay so how to go about your safety equipment before entering how do you go about if you see a colleague not wearing the appropriate safety equipment how do you talk to him how do you tell him that you should wear a helmet 
or should you talk to him or should you notify the supervisor? Okay. So you get a lot of these dilemmas, regardless of being a factory, a hospital, uh, a retail store, that really put you on the spot. Mm-hmm. And what we also get feedback from a lot of our customers, which is really interesting, is that it's so much um, safer or, or less yeah. intimidating to get feedback from a computer game yeah. compared I, I, to your supervisor or your boss. Yeah. Yeah, and we've you know the ter- the terminology you know whether you call it a safe place, a secure place, a co- right. It, sometimes people have different opinions on what the but ultimately it's people are comfortable feeling like I can get feedback and it's not necessarily coming to me as punitive from from a boss or a supervisor things like that. It's a little more you kind of almost insulate it, um, yeah. and, and that makes sense. The, yeah. the other thing that you brought up that's that's interesting. Um, you talked about right with the with the healthcare example, actually bringing in the company's IT systems to yeah. actually be able to say, hey, you know, I think about the the buzz around workflow learning and some of the challenges that a lot of times you run into is, well, how do you actually simulate something that feels really authentic? And to mm-hmm. me, that's actually a pretty solid bridge between, mm-hmm. well, it's it's about as close to the workflow as you can get because you're actually dealing with the real systems, the real environments that you mm-hmm. would deal with mm-hmm. versus kind of saying, well, we're, we're doing this phony thing like that. So that's that's an interesting application and actually being able to do that and almost combine. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you are you're combining the work into the simulation. Exactly. Yeah. And that is what builds the sense of mastery. I think very, very often when people are changing systems, there will be a dip in productivity and a lot of frustration as they go live with the new system. Because even though people have been through courses and seen videos, they they don't feel like they really master it. But with these kind of simulations, they feel like they've dealt with the, the, the most common situations already so they know exactly how to do it and they hit the ground running so we've we have several examples of that and mercedes-benz are using us globally to spread these kind of like solutions uh, and and changes in their system so it's it's uh, we have many examples of that i do think like if i were to summarize the, the four areas where i think we sort of like are being used the most i would say it's on onboarding new employees if you have many new employees that needs to come on board and basically tackle some base knowledge or base behavior, then that's definitely a a core area. I think the second is if there's a big change happening in the company of some sorts, then then typically we are very much uh, a a tool that can help you um, get that onboarded very easily. Um, I think the third element is around excellence, and it's really about duplicating best practice in your company. So if, if your best performers are considerably better than the others because they do something better than the other. They think differently, they prioritize differently, they just evaluate the situation differently and therefore have a different uh, behavior uh, from it, then that's definitely a third area. And I think the fourth area where we see very many start using us in is in uh, compliance training. So if you need everyone to be playing by the book on certain things and you can't play around with that, then of course you really want people to to understand that and then our technology would would typically help you do so better than many other uh, platforms. Okay, Hmm. interesting. Well, yeah, and I can see with the compliance piece, yeah, I mean, they all make sense to me, right? And, and even the one before, right? If you've got these top performers up here, and mm. that to me is where the game mechanics behind yeah. it is so critical because it's like, well, you're actually trying to get people to understand what what are these patterns that yes. I actually should be replicating to do that yeah. and how do I take these patterns and actually apply them to yes. what I'm doing versus taking a you know a quiz, here's a scenario, here's three really bad answers and here's the really long one that if I read it, I'm like, yeah, okay, I, I pick that one. Um, it's not yeah. necessarily, t- and the same with compliance. I think sometimes people don't understand with compliance training, they don't understand the why behind the what, right? It's just go through this exercise because yeah. c- the company said I have to do that versus in a simulation, you could actually show the consequences of mm. not doing it or what actually happens when that happens. I am curious. And actually Dina, Dina brought this up um, with, with COVID and everything suddenly shifting into this virtual space and and people almost needing to learn a new way to interact with people or learn a new way to interact with things. Have you seen 
you know, any uptick in that? Is that something that from a simulation standpoint is a, a topic that has started to become popular? I'm, I'm curious. We definitely see that classroom training is on its way out in many ways. And then you have different options of which way should you go. Some are trying to do these like virtual classrooms similar to this and so on. But they do see that sort of like very often in this kind of settings, if you try to train in this kind of setting, it's, it's hard to keep everyone engaged in the in the same way. So by creating the kind of games that we, we can, we can basically create uh, a much more uh, lively role play where you are training on the situation and then you can use settings like this. I think there was one of the questions earlier as well. How do you ensure that all this stress and so on don't impact the learning experience and actually don't uh, make you not learn? Well, we see that a blended learning approach where you can have people experience first and then be uh, joining forces to reflect over what they learned and so on is super, okay. super powerful. And, and very often we see quite a few now professional, uh, you know, Boston Consulting Group being, being one of them using our simulations in that way. And they have now, they used to do these uh, classroom sessions. Now yeah. they do onboarding training with our platform and then they are ensuring that we have these platforms to reflect. Okay. Well, I have to imagine to the question, if you're thinking about, and, and I actually have been working a lot on this as, as we've moved to this, you know, kind of virtual space, you almost have to dial back. What are the behaviors that you're actually looking to change with this stuff? And I think mm -hmm. that's something that, you know, is probably, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but probably one mm -hmm. of the most important roles that the learning mm -hmm. team or the, or the business team, whoever you're working with needs to understand, because if you don't understand like what are actually the behaviors or what are the things that they aren't doing that they should be doing, it's going to be really hard to build a game that actually drives people to do it because you have to build it around, well, this is the desired you know, way we want people to perform. And if you don't have that, I mean, I think of game designers, they mm -hmm. know what they want you to do at the end of it. They know the way they want you to do it. You have the freedom to work throughout that. So it, it mm -hmm. seems to me like that would be an important part. Absolutely. And I think uh, it's, it's not always necessary to have that crystal clear up front. No. Uh, because we, we do see as well, we have, I think, you know, we have many game designers and so on who are very creative. We have psychologists, but we also have quite a lot of management consultants on our side. And, you right. know, we work for one of these big uh, companies now with more than 100,000 employees. And they say, we can see that our best store managers are considerably outperforming the others, but we don't know exactly Why? what it is. We would love to use you guys to help us map that out. And then we are basically now in in an exercise of, of both talking to their leaders uh, throughout the whole pyramid as well as doing surveys and helping them finding those answers and based on that we can build then a uh, uh, um, high level design of how we want to tackle it and the good thing with that is that we can hear also what is the challenge and then therefore be much more creating tailored solutions that are fitting a hundred percent rather than if it was pre-baked so to speak by yeah. by the l d team so we can do either way but sometimes companies have a clear vision of that and that of course gives us yeah. a great starting point to to focus much more on the on the simulation well, that's a, I mean, it's a great clarification and it goes back to what you brought up earlier in terms of what a client engagement looks like, because, you know, sometimes it is just, hey, you bought the stuff like, here you go, figure it out. And if you already have all that figured out, great, you probably can move a little bit faster. But if you don't, it sounds like your teams are actually equipped to help people diagnose that to, to your example. We know that some of these stores are just crushing it and other ones are not. We aren't quite mm. sure what that what that differentiation is. And then you can help figure out, first of all, what are those things? And then how do we build a simulation to actually get more of those people into that? Um, mm. One of the things that, that Peter asked that, oops, hang on, it's not that one. This is the one I was curious about. So I think there's this generational thing that a lot of times can come up, right? Mm. Which can be a positive. The new generations are coming in. Um, they, mm. they may be more familiar with games and this can be a good way mm. to do that. I'm curious, though, do you see really a breakdown by generations? Because I can say in my social circles and just in general, I know a lot of people from all generations who will play a good video game, who will get into games. So does it necessarily only work with certain generations or will you see? No, honestly, it doesn't matter. People will, you know, maybe there's the resistance to kind of get a different generation to be used to it. But do you see a difference? 
I guess if you break down by by the demography, you you will see differences. But our core, I'd say, task in that whole picture is to bring the the entry level or the the onboarding, the tutorial of the game to such a low level that anyone can. I usually test the games on on my mom, which is uh, now retired. Awesome. She's close to seventy. And she gives me good feedback. So I don't, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how to navigate this. Okay, then we'll move the button. So as, as Christer talked about earlier, the iteration is mm. is so key, uh, not only for for the learning experience, but also for the, the user interaction. Because mm. when you create a game compared to creating business software, you would have a specification and when you're done with the specification and done testing, you can ship to production. When you create a game, you do 90%, 80% of what we do is like on specification because we've done this so many times. And then the last 20% is, is iteration, focus testing, making sure that the end user group, which is can be quite different at like a BCG professional services, compared to a, a retail hardware store. Mm. So we need to make sure that uh, that the user interface, although we have best practices, stick. And mm. also, I think, if you look at the macro level here, mm. at least in Europe in 2025, 80% of the workforce is going to be millennials. Yep. So um, 80% of all internet content today is consumed on the mobile. So they are used to the Netflix, the Amazon, the on-demand, constant, available on the mobile. So you also have to, when doing your L&D strategy, make sure that you include these tools that are matching the needs of your right. workforce. So there's like this big backdrop of macro trends, which also is pushing forward here. Yeah. Okay. So two follow-up questions. That, that's extremely helpful. And I think the point you bring up that, is one everybody can take from this is, I think sometimes we we don't always take into consideration how are our users actually doing things today? Like let's, let's remove the whole, what we want them to do, but what are they actually doing today? And if we take that into account, we can say, all right, maybe we don't tap into what they're doing, but we need to at least design around the fact those are the behaviors, those are the things that they're used to doing. Let's integrate with that so it doesn't feel like an insulated experience. Mm -hmm. so the two follow-up questions that I'm hoping we can squeak through. <laughs> I told you we were going to run out of time, but um, one is the on-demand piece versus sync. I, I did want to get a clarification on these games because I think it will help people understand. And even for my own knowledge, mm -hmm. are these things that, you know, it's it's truly a video game. So is this something that they can do whenever? Or is it something where there's a, a human involved that they have to schedule, things like that? How does it how does it work? So this is the real thing. No, <laughs> this is a cloud-based software as a service solution that is always available. You okay. can play on any device. It's fully cross-platform, mobile, uh, PC, Mac, even VR, if you want to do virtual reality. So it's all, always available on, on any device. So uh, it's a full online experience, although important because we've had airlines and stuff as customers, you can trigger offline. So you, if you are on a plane or if you are on a ship uh, in the middle of the Pacific, then you can also train. Uh, and it will offload as soon as it's online. So okay. it's it's catered to all needs, basically. Okay. So it is it's fully on demand in terms of, and again, yeah, you can toggle Absolutely. whether you have an internet connection, but it's not something that you have to schedule or anything like that, which I know no. there are some some solutions out there that because there's a human still involved, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're kind of still reliant on the human piece. Yeah, it's, are, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Chris. Go for it. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to add, like, it really depends what kind of learning experience you want to have. So we definitely do have customers who don't want us to release a game until a certain point because they know that at that point, everyone is going to do the game and then they want to have these reflective sessions afterwards. And therefore, you can sort of, like, trigger it if you want right. to have a joint experience or a joint time frame of, of experience. Uh, but but each individual is, is um, having a... a, a they are okay. not connected. 
Yeah. So as an L&D leader or, or an L&D organization, if you say, hey, we want to augment this as a program and have some other yeah. components. Yes, you could have a synchronous component kind of stage throughout. But the actual activity of the end user saying, I want to go, right, I mm -hmm. want to go play the sim. They don't need to wait on anything. They can basically just do it at, at, their, at, their, at the ready, if you will. And just okay, one last... small thing as well, Christopher, sorry, <laughs> because those of us who remember see the, um, computer games being installed by CD-ROM after CD-ROM, you know, the, the, the no, I remember gigabytes. when they were on the discs and you had to have like 37 discs that you had exactly, to Exactly, exactly. So even though this is a 3D environment, it's super big, immersive experience. It's three digits of megabytes. So it's super small. So okay. it's like downloads on your phone super fast. So... Uh, just to, to no, be clear on right. this. That's, like a, that's a good point to remember because, you know, if yeah. you have Steam or whatever and you download the latest games, right, you're talking gigabytes, gigabytes. I'm yeah. nearly terabytes of data yeah. to do this. And it's not it's not eating up everybody's corporate phone. And so all you try that. to stay below the Apple limit of like 150 <laughs> megabytes. And <laughs> there you go, which I have to say, it's pretty amazing how far we've come in, you know, with things because it, it used to be you used to need a ton of space for this. So, OK, so so then the last question, and honestly, I know we won't completely unpack this one because there's just no way it's too big. But mm -hmm. Peter brought this up. In terms of right, there's always the question around, you know, kind of the 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 return or you know, there's obviously an investment in making this. How do you then justify that? Rather than taking this approach of just a okay, you know, how do you quantify that? Because I don't know that that's always the right question to be asking, but I am curious because to me, as learning and talent professionals, our focus mm -hmm. is on changing behavior, right? Our yeah. focus is on getting people to behave in a right way. What kind of measurements do you help customers figure out to be able to say, in your example from earlier, you know, you used to have these stores performing like this. Now we want to have stores performing like this. That might be a bit of a stretch to say, well, because there's a lot of other factors, but you might be able to say, we know store managers mm. needed to behave this way. And now we have the data to show they, they can and are behaving this way. How do you help people strike that right balance of we did have a positive impact. I absolutely love that question. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think, you know, um, in the L&D space, very many are familiar with the Kirkpatrick model, which basically says that you can measure impact on four different levels. We have taken that very much to heart. So we actually measure on all of those four. When we start a project, we typically start by saying, how which what is the kpi that you're trying to impact uh, when we uh, work with a big uh, american-based uh, coffee chain uh, from from seattle we, we sort of like were uh, trying to understand what is it that you're really trying to get out of this and and that was really the basket size of of the customers and that then then that is guiding us on creating a solution that is tackling that challenge and then we can measure that both in terms of like, are people feeling like they are learning? Are the managers seeing that they're changing behavior and all that? But we're also measuring the basket size on those stores that have trained. And we can do a correlation analysis between those that have trained the most and those that have trained the least. And we can see a very significant uplift. So typically the ROI is very much in the forefront of our uh, talk. Um, I think uh, you know we we have examples of of that being uh, both double you know sometimes forty times the return on investment sometimes a hundred times yeah. the return on investments and so on so it's definitely something we we put a lot of focus on. Well, and the two things you hit on that I think are such an important part is right. You you start with that in mind. I think yes. sometimes we we fail because we we say well let's do the thing and then we'll figure out what we impacted after the fact instead of saying no, what are we trying to drive towards? Then let's design a solution to do that. And then the other piece that I would I would ask clarification on, just so I think I know the answer to this, but all those interactions that people are going through, this to me is the beauty of the digital space is you actually see that data, right? So yes. you can start to see how people are actually moving through this to see, well, yes. what are they doing? How many times did it take them to go through this stuff, which actually gives you actionable insights that you can say, hey, I know how to pivot or I know where we need to do more work because over here we have more of a problem than we do over here. Is that is that fair? That is spot on. And sometimes even our uh, clients actually see us as much as a, a diagnostic tool as a training tool because they basically 
we can take Perfect. them through the whole journey and we can see exactly where in the journey uh, they are struggling. We work with a big retailer. They thought that their challenge was around connecting with the customer. We had the, all their employees playing through a simulation and we saw that the key challenge was actually product knowledge. We went in and we focused on that and we in dramatically increased uh, their, their sales and they are now the most profitable retailer in Norway. So I think, you know, exactly as you say, data is everything and we are super focused on it. Okay. Well, look at that. We we managed to squeak it in, although we probably could keep <laughs> we probably keep talking about that for a while. But for the sake of everybody getting back to back to the things they need to do, we'll close it out on that. Um, this has been awesome. You know, I think it was a ton of fun. Great conversation. Hopefully, everybody watching, you know, you got something out of it. I, I definitely think, you know, you definitely probably weren't expecting to hear about Crash Bandicoot and World of Warcraft, but uh, I think we were able to really connect that in because there is a lot that we can learn from this. So uh, Annalise, thanks so much for being here. Same to you, Krister. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Friday, although your day is pretty much over and a fabulous weekend. Take advantage of the weather and Annalise, take a drink of water, get get outside oh. uh, before you, before you faint. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.